My name is Ben Greenfield, and on this episode of the Ben Greenfield Life Podcast. Our bodies take this apple and turn it into human flesh, and that is a natural transformation process. And you can use the principles of alchemy to simply describe or understand various steps in that transformational process. Faith, family, fitness, health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and a whole lot more. Welcome to the show. You might have glutes and you might have abs. What about a gut? How are your inputs and your outputs? See, what you put into your body affects, for lack of a better turn of phrase, your poop. And truth is, we could all be doing it better, even if we're fit. This is where a probiotic and prebiotic comes in, on the regular, for regularity. It turns out that everything you know about probiotics is actually wrong. It's a myth that a lot of fermented foods and beverages like kimchi and kombucha and kefir contain all the probiotics that you need. Many fermented foods and beverages either don't qualify or have a bunch of added sugars. But there are certain types of bacterial strains that can be delivered safely through probiotics that can make their way 100% alive and well to the end of the small intestine, then into the colon, where they can offer a host of digestive health benefits, in other words, easy poops. And these strains have been studied and they can actually work. There's one called the DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. I don't know why they name these things after Star Wars robots. Got 24 clinically and scientifically studied probiotic strains not found in yogurts, not found in most supplements, not found in most fermented foods and beverages. It supports your gut health for easy poops. That in turn supports your whole body health. And this is all made by a company called Seed, which even developed this patented delivery technology called the Viacap, which gets all the probiotics where they need to go down that giant garden tube more easily, more safely, more effectively. So you don't just create, I don't know, expensive probiotic capsules in your gut. So start a new healthy habit today. You go to seed.com slash Ben, S-E-E.com slash Ben. Use code Ben15. That'll give you 15% off your first month of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com and use code Ben15. All right. It's no secret that red stuff is good for you. It's good for your blood particularly. It's weird. It's one of those like nature signature things like blueberries and which aren't really red. They're kind of more like dark blue, but pomegranates, cranberries, uh, all sorts of the uh, like the dark red raspberries, beets, acai, you know, all of these are really, really good for the blood, but they're also good for uh, acting as cardioprotective foods, very good for the heart, very good for blood flow and increasing exercise endurance, providing a source of nitrate, which supports circulation and endothelial function, and even sexual function. Well, it's hard to figure out which ones to consume and when, and that's where this stuff called red juice fits in. So red juice has all of the different best berries in it, all from organic sources, which is important because berries have a lot of pesticides and herbicides on them. And then they add a clinical dose of cordyceps. It's made by this company called Organifi. So Organifi put together this superfood berry blend. People hear berries and superfoods and think sugar and carbs sometimes, but it's only got two grams of sugar, 13 different superfoods in this berry superfood drink, 100% USDA certified organic, which is unheard of with big berry compounds like this. And uh, they actually partner with Vitamin Angels as well to work to prevent illness and blindness and vitamin deficiency for innocent children suffering across the globe when you get any purchase of Organifi Red Juice. It's healthier than coffee, no crash, great afternoon booster, great for smoothies. I even use it as a meat rub. This stuff's amazing. No caffeine in it as well. It just supports energy with natural herbs and medicinal mushrooms and antioxidants. USD organic certified gluten-free, glyphosate residue-free, dairy-free, soy-free, vegan, non-GMO, 100% organic whole food, and you get 20% off. How? You get Organifi.com slash Ben. That's Organifi with an I dot com slash Ben to get 20% off of anything from Organifi. I got my latest shipment just in time for winter sports and physical activities, and I'm happy. It's my clothing shipment. There's probably, when you see me in videos and photos and stuff like that, one brand of clothing that I'm wearing more than any other brand. It's called Viori, V-U-O-R-I. My wife wears their performance joggers, which she swears is like the softest joggers she owns. They come in a bunch of new colors. 
you got to hurry up and get these new colors while you can because they sell out quick. You go to viori.com slash Ben, V-U-O-R-I.com slash Ben, and they'll give you 20% off your first purchase and free shipping on any order that's over 75 bucks and free returns. But they also have the leggings with a high waist, a drawstring tie, and no slip fit for girls. They've got their core short, which is their super comfortable men's lined athletic short with like compression built into performance. And then they got a men's performance jogger, which is awesome and super comfortable and great for lounging around on Christmas morning or Thanksgiving. I'm just saying. So viori.com slash Ben, V-U-O-R-I.com slash Ben is where you can go to discover the versatility of Viori clothing for yourself. Well, folks, I've been aware of my guest on today's podcast for a few years now uh, because he's 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 popped up all over the realm when it comes to natural healing. Uh, he was a whistleblower during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, he's he's a, a fellow lover of homeschooling, uh, which I of course have a have a distinct passion in, considering that's what I was educated with K through twelve and how I educate my sons and. Uh, He's also just basically a guy who is really spreading the truth right now about the world we live in today, fighting for freedom, and the vital knowledge that you need to truly care for yourself at the highest level. How to become your own health authority is something that this guy really specializes in. His name is Dr. Andrew Kaufman. We'll call him Dr. Andy. That's okay if we call you Dr. Andy, right, Dr. Andy? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Good. Just making sure. Didn't want it. Didn't want to disrespect. Anyways, though, so the show notes for everything that Andy and I talk about are at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Kaufman. Dr. Andy's last name, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. So bengreenfieldlife.com slash Kaufman. I'll link to uh, to everything that Andy does and what he's been up to. But he has a BS from MIT in molecular biology. He's got his uh, psychiatric training from Duke University Medical Center, very prestigious medical center. After graduating from the Medical University of South Carolina, he spent many years in the medical field as a forensic psychiatrist, an expert witness, and uh, according to what I've learned when he learned that many of the modern medical practices were harming people and not helping them, he gave up a lucrative medical career and started researching and understanding the true relationship between body, mind, and spirit, and how to use nature to heal your own body, and that's exactly what we're going to talk to you today. So, uh, Dr. Andy, there are so, so many places we could start. But I kind of uh, I, I kind of think it's it's quite interesting that you were a forensic psychiatrist, an expert witness in medicine. So fill me in on that, and and, uh, and what got you into doing that? Well, pretty much as soon as I had learned that forensic psychiatry existed as a subspecialty, I was instantly drawn to it because it's the opportunity to use your analytical and rhetoric skills to make an argument. And, uh, it, you know, it actually has a influence on people's lives and serious decisions of legal and administrative concerns. So essentially what it is, is it's the intersection of psychiatry and the law. And in psychiatry, there are actually a lot of special laws like to civilly commit a patient to take away their freedoms and uh, force them to receive treatment in the hospital, for example, something that as a psychiatrist, you're given these kind of police powers. Hmm. And so this is the avenue where these things get adjudicated in a courtroom or other administrative hearing. Um, and human rights are, uh, at least um, in paper, attempted to be uh, respected in this process. So I was kind of drawn to that. And, and it really was important in my development because it gave me the opportunity to hone my skills of investigation. Um, as a forensic expert, you're expected to go through massive amounts of information, uh, so-called evidence. So for example, uh, if I were an expert witness on a case, uh, let's say a murder case, for example, I was involved in a couple of those. Okay. Um, I would be given uh, a box <laughs> full of records that could include uh, records from school, from military service, from employment, um, it could also include witness statements and criminal records, which could be quite extensive. Uh, it could include testing results. It could include all kinds of health records from mental health uh, records and counseling to, you know, hospitalization, surgeries, all this kind of thing. And I would have to go through that mountain of evidence looking for things that speak directly to some question 
which I'm asked to make an opinion on. Like, for example, um, was the uh, defendant under a psychiatric crisis at the time the crime was committed or were their actions motivated by a you know delusional content like part of their illness rather than something in reality for example and this uh experience and then of course interviewing people for hours one time i interviewed uh one individual uh client for nine hours over two days Hmm. and you're trying to find you know that little bit of information that can speak to the issue and sift through a lot of things that are really unreliable or irrelevant. And that kind of thinking helped me approach uh, what's going on in the world today. So did something happen when you were in uh, forensic psychiatry or as an expert witness in medicine that made you step back and, and question? And, and it, it's kind of kind of along the lines of a guy I recently interviewed. His name was... Uh, was Gary Brecken. and he was telling me about how when he was doing insurance adjusting for a variety of different companies, he found that that the majority of chronic disease was related to hypoxia, and he felt guilty because he couldn't really help these folks. He could just generate numbers, and he wound up pivoting as, as a biologist and starting to treat people using things like exercise oxygen therapy and ozone therapy and you know mitochondrial enhancement and just kind of completely switched his career once he realized how messed up the sector that he was in was. So for you, was there like a, a triggering moment when you realized that maybe what you were doing wasn't really doing folks as many favors as, as you could be doing? Well, you know, there were several and it was a process. And, you know, I did something very similar to what you just described um, and I'm now completely out of that system. But I think a, a really early pivotal moment for me was when I was in my first year of training at Duke. And we had this weekly journal club that was very uh, important, like it was mandatory participation. It was called a critical appraisal of the literature. And we actually looked at scientific papers that were published and picked them apart because we were aware there was a lot of bias, especially in clinical research, like studying antidepressants and things like that. And we looked at this big article where a researcher who is outside of the mental health world got all of the data submitted to get various antidepressant drugs approved to the to the FDA. But these were unpublished data because the drug companies only publish things that make their drugs look really good. And but they have to submit everything to the FDA. So this um, scientist analyzed all of that data, published and unpublished, and showed that there was really no benefit for antidepressants at all. That was meaningful. Hmm. And we all agreed with the conclusions uh, by doing this critical appraisal. But then right after that, like the same day, we went to the clinics and we were still told to prescribe antidepressants um, without any change in our strategy at whatsoever. And this, you know, contradiction or um, hypocrisy really made an indelible imprint on me. And that was the beginning of me looking critically at everything that was going on in psychiatry and basically trying to divorce myself from the uh, mainstream practices. Hmm. So when, when things like that happen, is there like a lag time, do you think? I mean, when, when we find out something like antidepressants don't work or don't work as well as, as we would have thought, you know, I, I certainly see you know, mutterings about something like that, some research or piece of information or study will get released. Obviously, doctors are still prescribing and possibly even the entire medical school curriculum hasn't changed based on that. But is there is there an even approximate amount of time that it takes for, you know, new research to saturate in, in the medicine? Is it like two years, five years, 10 years, never? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the Institute of Medicine uh, has looked at this, although it could be another body, and it's somewhere on the order of like 11 or 15 years before 11 or 15. Geez, finding actually gets into the day-to-day -day practice of a majority of clinically practicing professionals. Wow! And I can you know give you lots of examples because there are things that I learned about many many years ago that when I talk to people. And they tell me about their diagnosis and what they're prescribed. They're still prescribed medicines that were known, you know, not to be effective 10 years ago or 15 years ago. 
Wow. That's crazy. I mean, just, just the amount of people that could be harmed or at least not served correctly or, or have money wasted in the medical system for 11 to 15 years. Jeez. There are two other really important things to speak to this issue. One is that it's very commonly told in medical school to the medical students that half of what you learn will be obsolete by the time you're out there practicing. And so there's an acknowledged uncertainty in the information available. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the famous uh, Professor John Ioannidis paper, probably the world's most famous epidemiologist in PLOS 1, that says more than half of all published research findings are false. So when we're looking at the body of evidence used to practice medicine, we're essentially largely looking at a combination of false conclusions as well as uh, just plain ignorance of the uh, overturning of false conclusions. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I came across a study this morning about how 85% of strength conditioning research is flawed or uses flawed methodologies, which is just absolutely bonkers when you think about only 15% of what you're seeing is is legitimate research. So, yeah, I would imagine that the doctors who are engaged in independent continuing education and who are who are actually studying up on them this stuff themselves, you know, which you see a lot in functional medicine, for example, that they'd be ahead of the curve. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It just seems like a lot of doctors are stuck in their old ways that they learned in medical school and and just aren't progressing much well, at all. It, you know, whether due to being too busy or or something else. Yeah, no, there are uh, mechanisms in place to keep doctors from looking for true information. Really? Like, for example, they're uh, extremely overworked in order to keep up with their overhead and make a living. That you think that's intentional to keep them from actually learning, I don't know, I'll call it the, the truth or whatever? Well, um, you know, whether it was established as something intentional or not, it still serves to function in that way. Because if you have to, for example, see one patient every six minutes in order to make your quotas, you're not going to have time to sit down um, and read the research literature. And you combine that with there is required what they call CME or continuing medical education. And there are a certain number of hours you have to do for for several different sources, by the way, like for your state licensure, um, as well as for your board certification. And so anyone trying to maintain board certification, now this is where they really capture you because there is this requirement for ongoing education, and some of them even have tests that you have to take every so many years or hand in a project or things like this. And they have to approve the materials that you use to educate yourself. So you can't just go out there and search the literature and the science yourself. You have to use their approved sources and materials. And it turns out that the sources of these materials are essentially these shell companies or foundations that are set up by the pharmaceutical industry to uh, put their marketing messages in the educational material. And this keeps you from looking outside because you're required to use these uh, sources in order to keep your credentials active. And uh, if you don't keep your credentials active, then you could risk your pay scale decreasing. You could lose your faculty status, your uh, malpractice liability insurance premiums can go up. There are all sorts of uh, consequences. So you're really stuck within the system, and it's very, very difficult to look outside unless you're willing to go outside the system and uh, run your own business, not rely on insurance companies. Um, and you know that's very uh, risky for most uh, folks in this profession. Although that's exactly what I've done. Okay, gotcha. And and you seem to have really focused as you pivoted out of forensic psychiatry and being an expert witness in medicine into this concept of how our environment affects our health. And I'm not, I'm not sure if there was like a triggering incident that caused you to begin to focus on the terrain and the environment in terms of your writings and your content and what you're doing now, or were you always aware of the importance of our, you know, even your new film, right? It's called Terrain. Yes. Right? So the importance of terrain, is this something that that's been a growing interest of yours or where did this start? Well, you know, I really came upon this empirically uh, because I first observed the shortcomings of the mainstream allopathic medical system. 
And, uh, you know, I had lots of personal experience with this. And then all, through all my investigation of the published literature, uh, essentially confirmed that way more people are harmed by that health system than are possibly helped. And so I had to look elsewhere. By, by the way, is it is it true, sorry to interrupt, the, the, the number three cause of, of death, from what I understand, in the U.S. at least, is uh, medical errors uh, and causing things like, uh, you know, sepsis, for example, and, you know, MRSA and, and all these issues that we see coming out of, of hospitals, which I suppose are now a very dangerous place to be. Well, I mean, according to uh, Johns Hopkins University research, uh, they estimated, uh, and this is more than 10 years ago, uh, 250,000 deaths a year from medical errors. But then there's additional data looking at deaths from prescription drugs taken as directed. And when you combine those two together, you're uh, well ahead of lung disease in the CDC's leading cause of deaths. But that doesn't account for actually all the medically induced deaths uh, because it doesn't mm. uh, account for vaccin vaccines. It doesn't account for chemotherapy. So there's other ways of looking at this data, and there are many different estimates. Uh, but I would say that okay. the third leading cause of the death of death is the most conservative estimate, and it only comes from if you're just using two published studies from the American Medical Association and from Johns Hopkins University. Okay. All right. Got it. So, so back to what you're explaining about your your journey to the importance of terrain and the environment. Uh, yeah. So. So I um, once I realized that I wasn't doing very good uh, medicating my patients um, and following the traditional psychiatry, I came across uh, very fortunately from a, a fellow um, in my kind of spiritual development group uh, suggested to read this book by Kelly Brogan, another psychiatrist. And she had kind of also had a similar path where she realized that uh, mainstream psychiatry was uh, not uh, really a, a good thing and found other ways of using diet and uh, some detoxification to address uh, psychiatric problems. And I tried this on my own and with one uh, colleague and had amazing results. So this led me on a path to just look outside the medical system at every, you know, expert that I could find who was in this space and see what kind of results they had and what kind of procedures or uh, substances, you know, lead to good outcomes if, if there are more. And so I did in, uncover a lot of different uh, practitioners um, over the course of several years studying this and studying their methods. And it was only after kind of collecting the um procedures and materials that led to the most healing that I saw this pattern, that it was essentially um, a lot of detoxification and nutrition, and all these materials were found in nature. And then when I began looking into things like pleomorphism, for example, and looking at the microbial world and what it does in nature and how nature essentially heals from illness itself, right? Like when we have uh, poisoned land or deforested land, for example, um, everything kind of came together that there is really a balance that is uh, established and maintains itself through, you know, all these homeostatic mechanisms in nature. And it always tries to restore itself to a state of optimal health. And that all of the procedures and materials that show empirically to lead to that kind of healing all support the natural functions of restoration, um, uh, and healing and rehabilitation. So uh, I kind of came to this formulation over time. And of course, uh, the, you know, the term terrain theory was already out there in the ethos, but it really resonated with me uh, when I heard it. And, uh, you know, it, it really applies to my message. Yeah, the terrain theory is something that I recently discussed with uh, a guest named Robert Slovak, who talked a lot about the the origins of human existence on on coastlines and the relationship between humans and seawater. And he was very into the the idea that if we replenish the body with you know constituents that are very very near to the electrolyte content of plasma, that that's one one example of how the the terrain is everything. And we kind of unpacked that pretty well in that podcast. That would be a good one, by the way, if you're listening in right now, go back and listen to that 
podcast with Robert to learn a little bit more about this this idea of terrain theory. But but now you're doing an actual film project based on this entire concept. Tell me about the film project, Andy. Yeah, well, uh, Terrain the Film is um, a project uh, with Marcelina Cravat, uh, who is an amazing filmmaker. And we met up early uh, during the pandemic years and uh, kind of hit it off right away. And she was just like super curious and wanted to know what what's really going on with all of the science, uh, what really helps people heal, you know, the same burning questions that most of us have. But she was willing to, you know, read any book I suggested and then get back to me with 100 more questions. And we developed this kind of uh, collaboration and through her process of learning about, um, you know, the reality of science um, underlying germ theory and viruses and how health really works, uh, she created uh, this film um, documenting everything she learned and uh, including some very key contributors along the way. And it so it kind of tells the story of her uh, transition or shift from the old way of thinking, uh, you know, being a patient at the local clinic and getting vaccines and antibiotics to a totally different way of, um, you know, thinking about health, taking responsibility, realizing uh, what is really uh, causing your health problems. How do you restore yourself and maintain health? And so we present this an overview of that whole um, shift process. And it's not just, you know, a scientific documentary. It encompasses the entire human experience in the context of the last uh, couple of years, at least uh, 2020 through the end of 2021, when we uh, finished up the film production. Okay. Got it. Now, now this this film, I've had a chance to, uh, your, your, your team sent it over for me to review and there's all sorts of little like you know bonuses and you go into all these different categories but i'd love to unpack a few of the concepts in the film just so people can start to understand this whole concept of terrain using some very practical examples and and by the way for those of you listening in i'm i'm working out uh, with with andy's team a, a special link and a, and a, and a code for you guys to be able to get access to this film if you go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash kaufman k-a-u-f-m-a-n I'll put it all over there. But you talk about water a lot. And I don't know if you knew this, Andy. My dad is in the in the water filtration industry. My brother works with him. My dad started off in, in coffee and coffee shops and wound up finding the number one thing that influences the flavor of lattes and coffees and espresso, in addition to the bean quality, was the water. And he started repairing espresso machines and changing up the water filtration uh, uh, technologies in a lot of these coffee shops and then wound up, you know, moving on to farms and homes and all sorts of stuff. So from about the age of 16, I've seen my dad take a deep dive in the water and I have a keen interest in it as well, but I would love to hear your take on water. Uh, and, and first of all, you, you say that water plays a central role in, in healing biological mechanisms. What's that even mean? What's, what's the central role of water in, in healing biological mechanisms? <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes I get ahead of myself with uh, technical language, but um, uh -huh. water, you know, has always been taught to me and to virtually everyone else um, in the context of biology as being a completely passive substance in the background, kind of like the air around you right now, but but not even the oxygen part, just the inner argon or nitrogen that doesn't uh, get absorbed into your body. And that actually, it turns out, couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, it's also kind of common knowledge that the, bo the body is composed of about two thirds um, or less for most uh, individuals who are chronically dehydrated, but about two thirds water by weight. But okay. it's not generally thought about that 99 out of every 100 molecules in your body is water. And the reason why there's that disparity is because water molecules are smaller and lighter than many of the biological mod molecules that make up the other 1%, uh, things like uh, proteins uh, and carbohydrates and nucleosides. So water is really what we are made of uh, principally. But the other thing that... Um, it is quite fascinating is that the water in our body is not the same as the water in our drinking glass or in our sink or in the swimming pool. 
Well, folks, one of the biggest predictors of how long you live and how good you feel while living is your metabolic health. Metabolic health can be difficult to measure, but the single best way to measure how your daily decisions are impacting your metabolic health is indeed by tracking your blood glucose. Monitoring my blood glucose is one of the most important things I do to maintain peak vitality and longevity. I can find out everything. How does ice cream affect my blood glucose? Cold, an argument, an email, you name it. Poor blood glucose control is associated with short-term outcomes like daily energy levels, weight management, and even sexual function. But then there's chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's, all of which are related to blood sugar levels. So that's where this company called Levels comes in. Levels has an app that interprets your blood glucose data provides you a simple score after you eat a meal, allows you to see how different foods affect you, and then gives you this personalized diet that's right for you. Obviously, you don't need me standing beside you or level to tell you that stick of cotton candy that you're eating at the fair is going to spike your blood glucose. But maybe you don't know what the difference between, say, like eating or not eating before you do a sauna session would create. Or say, you know, lifting weights at the gym and having whey protein versus rice protein. You know, there's all sorts of little things you don't think about that you can really dig into with this Levels app. So go to levels.link slash Ben, and they're going to give you two free months of the Levels measurement when you use my link. Levels.link forward slash Ben. So... I do red light. I just got done doing it like 10 minutes ago. It's amazing. Full body red light. Sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening, sometimes both. But the science behind red light therapy for supporting thyroid function, for supporting testosterone production, for supporting collagen, elastin, boosting cellular energy via triggering the mitochondria, healing damaged cells that have been under oxidative stress, helping with sore muscles, helping your joints to bounce back faster and get back in the gym faster. Red light does this and so much more. But not all red lights are created equal. The one that I use has undergone third-party testing. It has safety marks from nationally recognized testing laboratories. It's made from only the highest quality materials, including medical-grade components. And it is, in my opinion, the best of the best and gives you the highest dose in the shortest period of time. It's called Juve, J-O-O-V-V. I use their Elite. It allows me to treat my entire body in like 20 minutes, front and back. They also have Juve Go, which you can take on the go. Any of the Juves, you get a steep discount on. How? Go to juve.com slash Ben. That's J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Ben to pick up a Juve today. J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Ben. Quality, true medical grade, safety testing, and results from this stuff. Juve.com slash Ben. And, and by, by the way, I'm sure a bunch of people heard you say that, and it... It resonated, but they probably don't really, really fully understand. So I'm going to say it again, and then I, I would love to hear your your explanation. When you drink a glass of water, that's not what it looks like when it's in your body. It's basically what Andy's about to explain. So, so go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I know this is a uh, is difficult, or uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to wrap your head around at first. But let me give you a practical example from uh, my friend Tom Cowan on this. So. We've all had experience with a water balloon. So let's say a water balloon, you know, would be similar to uh, your skin uh, outside the water in your body, uh, like let's say your calf muscle, for example. Now, if we take a pin, right, and prick the water balloon, what happens? The water squirts out, right, in mm -hmm. that form. Now, if we take a pin and puncture our calf, right, or puncture a cell, for that matter, right, which is really like a microscopic water balloon in a sense, the water is not going to squirt out like that. Now, I'm not talking about if you accidentally hit an artery and, and it pumps out because <laughs> we all know that that can happen. But I'm talking about just by relieving the pressure of the water inside, right, it doesn't squirt out like in a water balloon. And that's because the water is actually in a, a totally different um, phase of matter, actually, it turns out, that is somewhat like a gel or a liquid crystal. And this occurs specifically in biological uh, surfaces or against biological surfaces, but also in other places um, in nature. And there are many ways to yeah. um, energize water into this kind of uh, gel liquid crystal type of. Stuff. Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd love to hear some of you, some of your tips for, for creating that scenario, but just because it's difficult for people, I think, to understand this idea of water being 
a gel. There's actually a, whole, a great book I read about this called called Quench. I haven't interviewed the author of this book about the idea of water in its in its gel form being present in many many fruits and vegetables and produce, for example. But if you were to let's say um, make chia seed slurry, like take chia seeds and dissolve them in water, and you get like this this nice stomach nourishing gel, or if you were to I don't know if anybody's ever had a sea moss gel before that'd be another example you can make it yourself you get sea moss and you hydrate it and you you blend it and you get this this nice gel like structure aloe vera gel would be another example just think about those textures and then imagine that your cell isn't like the sloshy liquid water it's more of that that gel based format that allows for a lot of the delivery of nutrients in and out of the cell and the proper flow of electrolytes etc and so uh, you were about to explain, Andy, how we actually optimize the, the formation of that kind of water in the body itself. Right. Well, let me uh, uh, first say that there might even be a more mundane example to understand what we're saying about a gel, because we, we might be familiar with Jello, right? Especially if you've been to the hospital. Oh, yeah, good point. They really like to feed you Jello there. And what is Jello? All it is is gelatin, which is a protein made from ground up uh, cow bones, but it's also in our bones and, and tissues. It's related to collagen. And it's that mixed with water. And, you know, we have to heat the water to make jello to help uh, the water interface properly and dissolve the gelatin protein. But it's really the interaction between the water and that gelatin protein, which is hydrophilic, that creates the gelled form of the water. So it's actually quite similar to what's inside of our body. And you know, you know how that the edge of the jello mold also, like it doesn't have a skin on it, like a membrane, but it still keeps its shape because right. it's in that gel structure, right? And so our cells and tissues in our body are very similar to that, right? And we see how they maintain our shape. Now, some things are maybe made of metal or harder materials like bones, but all our other tissues also can be very firm, like just flex your muscle and feel it. Uh, there's no metal in there, right? That's kind of gelatinous water <laughs> that you're that you're really feeling. Um, so the way that this happens inside your body, that the water turns into this uh, fourth phase of water or easy water or structured water, there are many names for this gelatinous type of water, is very simple. Uh, two things generally take place. One is that the water uh, is near what's called a hydrophilic or a water-loving surface, and that would be almost all of your tissues, including the inside of uh, blood vessel walls, uh, for example, um, and all of the kind of tubes and networks in your body. Um, and then the presence of sunlight in the form of infrared light, which penetrates uh, right through biological tissues, and it's it's the uh, kind of light that we can see at night uh, using night vision goggles, and it, it is really ubiquitous. So it's you have to have like a special chamber to actually prevent infrared light from getting in. So just with being exposed even indirectly at nighttime to the sun and having these hydrophilic surfaces allows your body to uh, create this uh, amazing form of water, which really carries out all the function of water, which I can expand upon. Okay, so when when people are, and I get this question a lot, when people are, um, let's say, eating foods that are in a gel-like format, like let's say jello or chia seed slurry or a fruit or something like that, or cucumber, or people are drinking water that apparently has a little bit more of this H2O bonding or H3O bonding, I think it is, like structured water, uh, you know, vortice water, you know, the type of water that the doctor, um, what's his name, the guy up at, at University of Washington who does the water research, you know who I'm talking about? Dr. Pollock. Um, yeah, Dr. Pollock wrote the Cells and Gels book. If people are are drinking that type of water or eating it, is that sufficient to allow for the the gel to form properly in the human cell, or do you still need to do some other things like uh, you know you mentioned light exposure, et cetera, to get the water into its ideal gel like format within the cell or around the cell? Right. Well, this is a a little bit more complicated than that because our bodies do this all on their own. They take any water that comes into our body, and if they're able to, there are some things we do which interfere with this, and that's how it relates to illness. 
But our body does this all on its own if we don't get in the way. Now, in terms of uh, drinking water that is in this state or closer to this state, there we are f- starting to find some benefits to this. Like we, there are definitely benefits that have been seen in plant growth, um, and we're getting some early data of studies in humans. But it's, I wouldn't say it's definitive. But it, for me, it's enough data to um, decide that for my family and I, all the water we drink is is energized or structured uh, by a device that I've researched and, um, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll use that water preferentially, um, even if I'm not 100% sure it will make a big difference in the long run. But more importantly, what we want to do is make sure that we don't interfere with our body's ability to have the water in this way, because it turns out that really if there there's either not enough water in our body or the water is contaminated with uh, toxins or pollutants uh, or waste products, that it it limits the water's ability to form this pure crystalline structure. And the crystalline structure is necessary uh, for the functions like of uh, locomotion of the of the blood vessels and of maintaining the Uh, membrane potential or the voltage like little batteries in our body so if we have a toxic lifestyle and and or we're dehydrated our body is going to be very limited to be able to form this kind of water and then we're going to have problems in our ability to carry out the body's functions okay all right got it what's the way that you structure uh, your water like do you have a, a special type of filter that you use uh, well, I use a device uh, called the Analemma water wand, and this was a de- oh, okay. so somebody just just recently sent me a bunch of those. I've been trying, you know, I make a big morning glass of water with uh, you know hydrogen tablets and a little bit of electrolytes and some vitamin C, and they they say that if you if you stir the water, it's kind of silly for me because I have a whole house structured water filter, but I'm just using this just to, out of curiosity, and also when I travel. Apparently, you stir the water with this wand for 30 to 60 seconds, and it and it somehow structures the water. Yeah, it's a very fascinating device. And, you know, the reason that I use it is because of the degree of testing and uh, um, scientific, um, uh, you know, analysis that's been done independently of the device. But it, it's a little bit unique because what happened is that its creator, uh, Dolph Zantinga, uh, who's really a scientist, studied how water gets structured in nature, but outside of organisms. Like, uh, because he found structured water in nature and in some uh, natural streams or springs or reservoirs. And so he has tried to mimic this process, starting with, um, actually, I'm, I'm not positive what water he starts with. I believe it's a natural water source. And he puts the water through this process over an entire year and then puts a small aliquots of it into these quartz cuvettes, which the quartz allows the um, the structured property or energy to um, be transferred to another body of water. It can't be a glass tube. And when you stir it, then he, you know, there are ways to measure that now that water is structured, like specifically there is um, a unique um, uh, absorption pattern uh, that that is, separates it from bulk water that you can test in a laboratory setting. For example, Dr. Pollock has published the standards on that. So, so when you stir water with this, not only does it become energized or structured, but it actually it maintains its structured state um, even when exposed to like radio frequencies, cell phones, smart meters, things like that. And it's been tested up to a full year and it's stable over that time. So um, hmm. it's, a, it's a little bit unique. Now, other uh, technologies probably haven't been uh, fully tested. Uh, so there may be other ways to do that. But, uh, but he did take the uh, step to, to do this kind of testing. Okay, got it. So, uh, but but no no filters or anything like that. You're mostly just using this stick to stir a lot of the water that you drink. Yeah, well, I do have. Um, actually, I believe this is from uh, your dad's company. I have a, uh, a spiral uh, hose pipe attachment um, for like watering the garden or or your uh, you know raising uh, vegetables and things like that. And okay. I, I've planned my own experiment in the spring. 
And I know that this kind of experiment has been done successfully with other devices, but I'm going to put grass seed um, in my lawn and water half of it with this device and the other half without it with just the same hose and water. Um, and I'm going to monitor the the density and the and the uh, rate of growth and see hmm. what the difference is. And, you know, interestingly, in other studies like this, they've actually found even improvements in the mineral content of the soil, uh, even when rainwater was uh, structured and given to um, tomato plants versus uh, rainwater that's not been structured. Fascinating. Okay, so... Do you, uh, when, when you're using these type of devices, and by the way, I, I do like the concept, they, they make those kind of things for shower heads, for, yes. for the end of hoses, for the whole house, if you want to do the whole house. And, and I try and, and structure most of the water that I use. You know, I, I always make sure I get rid of impurities first. Are you concerned at all yes. about that? Are you using yeah, like no, carbon no, block no, or reverse I, osmosis or anything? Absolutely, yes. I For my, uh, I'm in a city on city water, so I use a reverse osmosis uh, filter, but that is the first and most important thing is that you're not drinking poisoned water. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Got it. So when you're when you're using all of these tactics for the water, do you add anything to the water? Like, are you a fan of of adding back in minerals? Uh, some people are into like the hydrogen tablets in water. Are you messing around with any of that, or are you just going with pure water? I, I'm just going really pure water. Um, the only thing I do add is my intention of gratitude. Uh, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Got it. Yeah. And then that's, that's something that I know can, you know, be a, a quantum principles affect some of the, some of the structuring of the water in a very interesting way. And some people think it's woo woo, but I, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt. That's for sure. Well, you know, there's a, there's a really fascinating experiment that uh, you can do at home actually that really? has been, it's been replicated. Yeah. If you just, and this doesn't, you don't need a structuring device to do this. Actually, you could just use regular tap water but what you do is you you mix, uh, let's say, a quarter cup of rice um, in a full glass of water. You do it three glasses, same same thing. And um, the three glasses, and you do this for a couple of weeks. Um, every day, uh, one glass, you say, I love you, too. Uh, one glass, mm -hmm. you say, I hate you. And the other glass, you ignore. Okay. And... and after two weeks, see what changes occurred, uh, because there will be breakdown of the rice, uh, but it will occur in different ways in the different glasses, just based on your intention and how you related to that water. Fascinating. Okay, it so really is fascinating. So with the with the water, the other thing that you get into is, uh, and I want to talk about this whole idea of an alchemical detox, because I know that's another thing that that came up in, in the terrain project, but this idea of just drinking water, like water fasting, do you, do you encourage water fasting? And, and if so, how and why do you pull that off? Well, water fasting is uh, perhaps the purest and certainly one of the most powerful ways to heal because this is what all animals do in nature um, in order to heal. When they're sick, injured, they fast. And we've all observed this to some degree. And the same thing is true for you. And essentially what it does is it allows your body to purify its water from all these contaminants and thus restore full function. And uh, there's even in the mainstream literature, uh, there's tons of evidence of the effectiveness of this. I've done it myself uh, several times, including a 26 day uh, extended water fast. And uh, it's something that uh, I definitely talk about. And in fact, I'm developing with my um, apprentice, Dr. Grayson Dart, a water fasting supervision clinic. Okay. And how's a water fast actually actually work? How, how many days do you go? And what do you, what do you feel like as you do this? I'm just curious. We haven't talked about water fasting a lot before on the show. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, the minimum time to call it a fast would be 24 hours. But that's not really long enough to address a serious health concern, although it may still be helpful. You may feel energized and uh, have some moderate uh, benefit. So we're talking about um, really if you want to get into some major healing, I would say it has to be 10 to 14 days minimum, although 21 days seems to be from experience a major threshold that it that you have a life changing experience if you do 21 days or longer. But you get into um, what's called a ketosis uh, metabolism, 
um, starting around seven, eight days. So you can have several days um, in that kind of a, of a healing state if you do sort of a 10 to 14 day fast. So that would be kind of too it's a long time. Well, I mean, it, time is all relative. Um, it's yeah. safe to fast um, for three or four months, actually. Um, and many people have done that, uh, especially people who are very uh, overweight um, can fast that long very easily. But we're all capable of um, going that long without any uh, starvation or major health consequences. Do you do that and, yourself very often, That this, this longer, like 10 to 14 day water fast? Well, you know, you, it's not good to do it terribly often because you need to have uh, your body needs to kind of completely recover from it before you do it again. You know, it's when your body goes through that level of healing, um, it's a lot of uh, things to undertake. And, and, you know, the reason why you have to rest while you're fasting is to allow your body to use all its energy for that purpose. And so you don't want to put your body through that kind of um, procedure again so soon, unless, you know, it's a necessity like that you're, um, addressing a life threatening illness and, uh, you may need to fast, uh, several times to recover completely. Hmm. So some folks recommend waiting six to nine months before doing another long fast. Now, if you're doing shorter term fasts, then it's no problem to uh, do them on a you know somewhat uh, regular basis. Like for example, if you wanted to fast one day a week, um, you could certainly keep that up, and it would not have any adverse effects um, in terms of nutritional depletion or anything like that. Hmm. Um, I did one uh, about a month ago that was eight days, and um, I wanted to actually go a full two weeks, but um, I had <laughs> unfortunately too many. Um, a business obligations to uh, extend it, and I had to cut it short a little bit, but uh, it was still very beneficial. Hmm. You, you ever test your blood or anything before or after to see if there's any noticeable changes or anything in particular that really stands out in response to a water fast? All my experience as a physician has uh, led me to conclude that blood tests are very misleading. Really? So I uh, really never use any kind of diagnostic uh, testing. I find that you can always figure out what's going on uh, by simply talking uh, to someone and asking the right questions. Really? But um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I guess I don't, I don't know. Let's say something like um, I don't, vitamin D. How how would you uh, quantify vitamin D blood levels with talking? Well, I wouldn't have to look at their blood. I would look at their health. And I would look at, uh, ask them about, you know, their lifestyle, what, what they're eating, where, what they're, are they spending time outdoors? Where do they live? And it'd be pretty easy to know if they were getting a sufficient vitamin D, either from a dietary source, from being out in the sun. Also, were they getting enough saturated fat and cholesterol in their diet in order for their body to have the raw materials to make vitamin D? And then there are other, hormones that are related to, uh, to vitamin D uh, also being synthesized from cholesterol. So I would look at those issues and things like testosterone, for example, because often uh, when there's uh, problems and deficiency in one, the, there's mm -hmm. is the other. So it would basically be focused on, you know, understanding what the individual's health concerns are um, and then, you know, looking for the causes of those things and helping them uh, by teaching them the information hmm. to correct it. You know, you can get uh, a blood vitamin C to go into an ideal range by taking a, vit a synthetic vitamin D3. But every time you put that into your body, your body sees it as a foreign substance, not as a food nutrient. And you have an inflammatory response. And, and it's not even all of the vitamin D components, it's just one purified out. So is that really going to be an optimal uh, way to improve your body's health? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm not saying, you know, this is something you recommend, but, uh, but it's not the way I look at things. Now, now what would you say the same thing for like, I don't know, urine testing or stool testing or like salivary genetic testing and things like that as well? There's really not any diagnostic testing whatsoever that I ever recommend or think has value. Okay, interesting. So, you know, you, you don't hear that 
often these days in terms of quantification. <laughs> right. There's even people who will do like, I don't know what you think about this, like electrical analysis, you know, like, like an AO scan or a body scan or or some type of an electrical analysis of you know meridians and chakras and things like that. Would, would you say the same thing for those type of quantification protocols? Well, you know, the uh, main basis that I've criticized, for example, the uh, false diagnostic tests for COVID was because they were never actually validated. And a validation study is where you basically show, does something measure what you say it measures? And I've not found most of these kind of tests that you've mentioned to have undergone any kind of basic validation. So they don't have a known error rate or other characteristics. So there's no way to judge the validity of their information. But let me uh, further expand that even if these things are validated and are the gold standard. So recently, um, someone I knew was uh, pregnant and thought that they had a miscarriage but weren't sure. And their um, midwife had uh, put them through this series of blood tests. Now, I had heard about this from medical school. And if you look up in any OB book, this is the gold standard of how to tell if the pregnancy in your belly is still alive. You get three blood tests that are called quantitative beta HCG. That's the pregnancy hormone. But in this case, it's not a yes or no test. It's the actual amount of this hormone in the blood. And it's supposed to be going up during the B first trimester of pregnancy. And so you get three samples uh, each two days apart. And if the trend is the number's going up, then the pregnancy is good. And if the number is going down, then you have essentially uh, a miscarriage that hasn't come out yet. And so she did this test. It showed a miscarriage. And then she went for an ultrasound and it showed the baby was alive and healthy. Hmm. So if we rely, if she relied on this test and decided to get an abortion, like to clean out the dead material in her womb, she would have ended up killing an alive uh, baby growing inside of her. Wow. Crazy. And huh. So th that's, you know, how um, uh, I don't want to have that kind of a situation. And, you know, we could have done something very simple, you know, like um, listen for the baby's heartbeat <laughs> yeah. to uh, to find out if there's a baby in there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. OK, so let, let's say that one was going to proceed with water fasting and, you know, whether or not they were going to you know test or, or quantify. This seems to be pretty related to this other concept that you seem to cover quite a bit in terms of the terrain and the environment. And that, that's what you call an alchemical detox. I don't think I've seen that phrase before, alchemical detox. What's that mean? Well, alchemy is kind of this um, ancient uh, science that many of the uh, famous scientists and philosophers that were taught about in school studied. Uh, but it's not taught about um, except for the kind of fantasy of turning lead into gold. But what alchemy really is, is it's a way to understand changes in nature like transformations, like for example, um, let's say that we eat a food like a, a, an apple. Okay, so we take an apple which is in a certain form in nature, right? It has a red skin, it has flesh, a stem, etc., seeds in the middle. We put that in our body, our body transforms that apple into something totally different, right? It becomes part of our flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of it comes out in our stool, but when it does, it doesn't look anything like an apple. Right. Unless unless we have some maldigestion syndrome. <laughs> but um, so our bodies take this apple and turn it into human flesh. And that is a natural transformation process. And you can use the principles of alchemy to simply describe or understand various steps in that transformational process. And once I learned about these uh, steps and the way of looking at things in nature through this simple formulation, I saw that it applied to healing transformations um, because that's, you know, when you're in a state of illness and despair and disharmony, and then you take steps to bring about true healing, which involves not just doing physical things, but also addressing psychological and spiritual like existential issues you go through this process where you transform into a healthier state. And hopefully that is a complete transformation 
to meet your goals, but even so, it's still um, a change. And and these steps that are described in alchemy are inevitably involved. So after observing that, I simply applied this kind of understanding to all of the detoxification uh, science and knowledge that I have. So the course really is teaching uh, a comprehensive um, understanding of the principles and practices of detoxification in general, and by the way, including um, a whole module on water. But it's understanding them in the context of these alchemical transformational process that you will go through from the start to the finish of your your own personal healing and detox program. So what would what would the alchemical detox actually look like? What would we, what would somebody be doing on a on a sample day of something like this? Well, you know, the course kind of teaches you how to to establish your own customized protocol to address a variety of health issues. And so once you got to that stage, then, you know, you would basically have a plan and and it would involve a number of things. So if you're going to go through a typical healing protocol, it would it would take a minimum of about a month's time. It could be extended depending on what you're doing and how how much your health is affected. And it'll involve several components, like there'll be a, a, a special diet that you'll be on, which allows your body to cleanse. And that could be fasting, right, which you don't eat anything. It could be a liquid type of diet where you're just having juices. Um, or it could be um, another kind of uh, cleansing diet. Usually, that involves just a vegan diet, but occasionally there might be a combination where there's a, some kind of nutrient dense food added to it. And so it depends on your unique situation. Then there'll always be a component of hydration to make sure that you're properly hydrated and that your needs for water may go up during your cleansing to help your body flush out toxins. Like this is definitely true during a water fast. Um, my last water fast, uh, by the end, I was drinking six and a half um, uh, liters of water uh, in a 24-hour period, which is uh, far more than I would uh, need to drink um, going through my regular day-to-day -day unless I'm doing some heavy um, lifting or something. Okay. And then, and then there would always be an elimination aspect to the program because if your body is going to loosen up these toxins that it's been storing or that have been causing disease in parts of your body, it needs to get them all the way out. So usually involving the bowels or the skin um, or other uh, organs of elimination. Okay, got it. So when it comes to this alchemical detox, uh, you, you talk about healing solvents. And I'm curious what a healing solvent is and how that would be used as a part of this protocol. Sure. Um, healing solvents are essentially oily liquids uh, that we are familiar with many of them, but I know that they're not generally formulated this way, but they include uh, castor oil, essential oils, uh, DMSO, um, coconut oil, uh, and turpentine, which is really my, uh, my favorite for uh, really um, intense healing uh, situations. Okay. And what, what my theory is, um, or my hypothesis, and I don't have studies to test this, but I do know that using these um, healing solvents in various ways uh, has resulted in amazing um, recoveries from serious uh, you know, illnesses, things like lupus um, and other things, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, etc. We could talk about that. But what I think happens is, is that since our body is made of water um, and that there are many of the toxic substances which are man-made, which are not dissolvable or soluble in water. And these build up like a greasy sludge inside of our body in various places, just like they would be in a clogged um, pipe in your sink. If you've ever cleared one of those, you see that along the walls of the pipe is this kind of greasy sludge. And I think a similar kind of substance accumulates in your body and can cause lots of problems with health. And that these solvents are able to um, dissolve it away, um, but in a biologically compatible way, because all of these uh, solvents come from plants in the natural world. Um, and they can dissolve it away, so your body can completely eliminate it. And this is uh, a procedure that allows you to 
uh, recover well from many diseases. Would that sludge be like biofilm or something like that? Or, or do we even know? Well, I mean, I haven't, you know, actually discovered the substance or uh, really named it, uh, but um, it may be, you know, similar to that. I'm not sure if that is an oily substance uh, or not, mm. but, you know, we've uh, anyone who's done an enema or a colonic has uh, seen some of this material or, uh, you know, by various other uh, kinds of protocols yeah. with laxatives. I was thought it was just like a colonic mucosa or something like that. When when I when you see these stringy things kind of coming out the butt after an enema or something along those lines. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that is, uh, you know, waste products that build up on the surface of the inside of your um, intestines, and they're they're kind of sticky, and uh, you know, uh, they don't come out so easily. So when you start doing cleansing procedures, your body uh, goes into this mode where it starts putting this stuff out hmm. uh, more. You'll, you know, you'll experience this uh, when you, if you do one of these, that you, you'll have uh, foul smelling things that are, uh, you know, uh, unexplainable uh, in the toilet or even uh, many times seeing worms uh, in the toilet, uh, depending on what's going on with your health. Now with, with the colonics or, or the, or the enemas, for example, one concern that people have about those is that they could nuke the good bacteria in the colon or kind of clean you out too much. What do you think about that idea? And, and do you have some way to replenish good bacteria if so? Yeah, well, this is definitely a risk of, for colonics. I mean, colonics have to be used only, you know, intermittently, um, and for certain situations in a very time limited uh, manner like you know two or three and then none for six months uh, kind of thing because they can cause those problems and that is very different from an enema because you're using a high volume of water under pressure and it's going you know all the way up to your small intestine now when you're using uh, a regular enema um, you're using a smaller much smaller volume like one liter or less and it's only going really into your uh, rectum and sigmoid colon uh, not very far at all and uh, I don't really think there's any risk uh, from doing that, uh, I mean, unless you're putting poison water or some other kind of poison. Yeah. Because, you know, just having or, some, or perhaps coffee uh, or something like that that has contaminants in it. Well, yeah. So it is important if you're going to do coffee enemas that you use, uh, you know, organic coffee. I mean, it still may not be the healthiest thing for your gut, but that's for you know, a different purpose. And coffee enemas is actually something I'm a big proponent of because there's amazing data on it. But it is, once again, a time-limited uh, use. You're not going to do coffee enemas forever. You're going to do it for a period, usually two to four weeks, um, in order to uh, improve your liver function. And then, then you don't, you know, then you don't need to do it again and, you know, until next year or, or, or maybe not at all, um, you know, unless you're doing like a serious protocol for a life-threatening cancer or something like that, you may do it for a more extended time, but it's a time-limited procedure. With regular water enemas, there are some people who are so chronically constipated that they're unable to reactivate their bowels um, or they're unwilling to go through the kind of tedious long-term commitment to bring that about. And Using a daily uh, enema is is not been harmful in my experience. In fact, uh, really can uh, help uh, stimulate good elimination. Hmm. Now, what about the liver? The, I mean, because what I understand is that the coffee enema, for example, can really help to move things through the liver and and the gallbladder as well. As far as like a bile dump, I think they've even like quantified or, or shown in some type of a scan the amount of bile that's released in response to a coffee enema. But do, do you have anything particular that you recommend for the liver or the gallbladder beyond something like that? Well, there, there are, uh, in fact, another module in my uh, alchemical detox course is on the liver uh, because this is a, an issue that's commonly a barrier to healing. And what happens is that because of our lifestyle, that many of the things we're exposed to cause uh, liver congestion, which is the same process that leads to what people know as a fatty liver um, and eventually cirrhosis of the liver. And these are mostly um, processed uh, food additives and, and uh, carbohydrates. Um, they are alcohol, of course, and pharmaceuticals um, are the biggest uh, insults to our liver. And the liver gets clogged up and can't process as much of the waste over time. And this can cause all sorts of problems. So one thing is it causes the things to bypass and go to the skin. So a lot of skin conditions, 
um, and as well as allergies and asthma are um, worsened because the liver can't process these uh, poisons accordingly. Um, of course, you talked about the stones uh, that we get, and that's especially when you combine this problem with dehydration, you increase the risk in certain dietary factors. Um, so all of these things can be addressed uh, through various procedures, you know, that don't involve any surgery or antibiotics or anything like that. Um, coffee enemas is one a very effective uh, way to address the liver, but it's not something that you just do a coffee enema and, and uh, forget about it. You want to also give your liver some rest. So you want to avoid wheat, meat, and dairy uh, for a period of time. Those require the most energy from your liver for digestion. Really, meat meat does, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And, and not you know not saying that it's not healthy to eat meat, but it does require a lot of uh, effort from your liver to process um, all the nutrients. And so when you're in working on your liver, you want to rest your liver as much as possible so it can go into healing mode rather than being stuck in digest digestion mode. And then later on, when you're finished that and you're rebuilding the liver, that's when you want to maybe eat liver because then it gives your liver the exact right nutrients to mm. rebuild the liver, uh, you know, in a pure way, wherever it's been damaged. Yeah. That's the whole uh, kind of like uh, like, like supports like idea, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, but, but there are other things to do. There's a uh, certain specific nutrients that your liver needs to function optimally. So you want to include those in your diet, things like uh, flavonoids, for example, um, sulfur-rich amino acids uh, like cysteine and methionine to help uh, make glutathione and other uh, compounds. Um, so you want to include specific foods containing those nutrients, or some people even recommend uh, supplements like MSM uh, for sulfur, or you could take a conjugated, uh, you know, cysteine, uh, uh, tablets. Um, I'm not a fan of those. Is but conjugated the, cysteine, is that like the N-acetylcysteine? No. So that N-acetylcysteine is a precursor. Um, and that would be something else, uh, that, uh, you could include to repair the liver. And, um, if, if you ever have an accidental poisoning, you, you definitely want to take NAC and acetylcysteine and, and vitamin C. Um, and if you take combine those two things with water and milk thistle, uh, chances are you could probably survive almost any poisoning. Hmm. Water and milk thistle plus what? NAC and vitamin C. Okay. So if you had some kind of poisoning, you would do NAC, vitamin C, milk thistle, and water, and that would flush the body really well? Yes. And, huh. you know, there might be other things you could, that's when the poison's already inside your body. If it's still in your gut, you can use a, you know, binding agent like charcoal or zeolite or bentonite clay uh -huh. um, also to prevent it from being absorbed into your body. But once it's in the body, those things uh, could save your life from almost any kind of poison. Wow. That's fascinating. I haven't heard of that combination before. Really interesting. And by the way, for those of you listening, I'm taking notes here that I'll put at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. You also appear to be a fan of shilajit. I noticed that you talked about that in the alchemical detox. What's going on with shilajit? Yes, well, um, shilajit is a really important um, form of trace minerals. Uh, because of the way we now grow food, where we're not growing it on our own land and we're not putting uh, the animals and our waste back into the soil, that essentially after two growing seasons, you're removing many of the minerals from the soil. Um, and then, you know, the food is going to another location. So nothing ever replenishes the minerals. And pretty much all of the food we eat is devoid of these minerals. And, you know, there are about 50 or so trace minerals that we need. And it turns out that most of the proteins in our body use these trace minerals, these metals. So, for example, hemoglobin, we know that has an iron in it. And the iron is the part that binds the oxygen. So it's critical. And there are many of these, though, uh, like things like manganese, copper, uh, zinc, molybdenum. Uh, some of them you may not have even heard of, but our body uses these things. But we don't have them. And instead, we have toxic metals that we're exposed to, things like lead, um, hexavalent chromium, um, and uh, aluminum from vaccines and food storage containers, right? Right. And so our bodies actually, and this has been shown scientifically, will substitute these toxic metals 
because it's kind of better than nothing, but our proteins can't function optimally. Hmm. So shilajit is essentially decomposed ancient plants, um, but just the part of them that contains the minerals. The other part has, you know, been uh, biodegraded back, um, you know, into uh, CO2 probably. Yeah, uh, mostly the, the carbon, right? So we're left with these minerals, um, and they're conjugated to fulvic acid, which is what plants used to suck the minerals out of the soil and deliver it to their leaves and stems. And so this is, if we were eating plants that had the minerals, it would be in this form, but this form is essentially like a, a tarry, uh, kind of earthen, soily, humus-type substance. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the, really the interesting. I've, I've used it before in, in a liquid and also in a tablet, and it's very interesting. And I mean, you, you feel a little bit of energy from it too. Isn't it Russia called the the conqueror of mountains or something like that? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, um, the, and Mumio is the uh, Cyrillic name for it. Okay, uh, that means means conqueror of mountains. Absolutely. Fascinating. And uh, so, yes, because if you're devoid in these minerals, which we we all are then your body's physiology is not optimal. And when you replenish them, you can notice uh, various types of improvements. All, all kinds of uh, things improve sexual function, improved uh, growth of hair, skin, and nails, um, uh, improvement of like edema, like swelling of tissues, uh, some folks have reported. Um, all these kinds of uh, improvements can occur wow. once you replete yourself with minerals. And this is obviously all kind of like, uh, it's all organized if someone were to go to your alchemical detox course. Uh, I think it's called uh, True Medicine University is your your website. And so, so you you walk people through how to do the colon, how to do the liver, when to take the shilajit, all these things. Yeah, so for um, all of these procedures, um, first of all, there's like a video um, lesson uh, that I teach you about all these things. And then we have tons of reference uh, documents, as well as all of my written protocols, which are there in very, very detail. So it includes, you know, how to guides, tips, uh, places to record your pros progress and plan out your own detox plus exactly you know the protocols that i've developed and that i teach uh, to my clients um, that you can either use you know as a template to customize or you can use them exactly uh, that way um, but it, it's really um, designed so that you can learn everything from the all of the theoretical background information to the clinical evidence for these various substances and procedures all the way to the very practical how do i do this uh, you know, what kind of materials do I need to buy? Um, you know, what are the tips and tricks to overcome uh, troubleshooting? And then also everyone who's in the course gets access to uh, a special telegram group for students only where I answer questions um, about the material on a daily basis. Okay. All right. Cool. And then the, the film project, that's something different. That's something that, that people can go and watch on a different website, right? The the uh, terrain project. I yes. Mean. Uh, yeah, well, the terrain, the film is, uh, you know, a regular movie. In fact, um, uh, much to my surprise, uh, it's just been listed on Amazon Prime. So you can actually go to any hotel, anyone's home in the world, pretty much, um, and get on the computer or the TV and can stream it right on Amazon. Okay. So this is a major breakthrough to, you know, get this to a much, much wider audience. And we, we negotiated with them to have the cheapest price available. So it's only 99 cents actually to watch this film. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll link to that as well. So you guys can check it out. Actually, it's a really great film and builds on a lot of the concepts that Andrew just kind of didn't get a chance to take a deep dive into today, but gave us a real good preview of, and I'm even thinking about perhaps, cause I like to do a little bit of a detox at the beginning of each year. I'm thinking about trying out this alchemical detox myself, just as a little bit of immersive journalism. And if I do, I'll let you guys know how it goes. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time here, but what I want to tell folks listening in is that if you go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash Kaufman, I'll, I'll link to Andrew and in his alchemical detox and his film and everything else that he does. And any, any last words that, that you would like to share with people regarding their internal terrain or detoxification or anything like that while I have you on, Andrew? Well, I just want to really leave um, uh, an overall guiding message, which is that um, each and every one of us are really capable of taking charge of our own 
um, health and healing and learning this information or uh, working, you know, with someone who really knows it to help educate us and taking your own steps. Like you don't need to be dependent on the system. You don't need to take poisonous pills or injections. You don't need to get sliced open. Um, you just need to learn how to use these natural approaches and take control of your life. And you can really um, do everything you want to do and have amazing results. Amazing. All right. Well, cool. I will I will link to all this at bengridfordlife.com slash Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. Andrew, you're doing some really helpful things in the health industry. So thank you for what you're doing and uh, keep up the great work, man. All right. Thank you so much for having me on, Ben. All right, folks, till next time, I'm Ben Greenfield along with Dr. Andy Kaufman signing out from bengreenfieldlife.com. Have an amazing week. Just imagine a hotel surrounded by nature, vineyards and gardens, this forest classified as a historical garden in a very special country at a hotel located in the oldest demarcated wine region in the world. Imagine this place has a state-of-the-art spa, 2,200 square meters. 10 treatment rooms, an indoor pool with underwater sound and chromotherapy. Imagine a kitchen team that brings to the table not just delicious food at this place, but values environmental sustainability and wellness and local sensitivity and global sensibility. Imagine being able to be bathed in luxury and being able to be local, to buy local, and to eat local, not caged off as some fancy tourist, but as a part of the community and part of the terroir of the region. Well, that's exactly what you experience in Portugal at their Six Senses Luxury Retreat. And I'm going to be there for a special event that you can read up on at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Six Senses. It's called the Boundless Retreat. And at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Six Senses, you can see everything we're doing. Every day starts with a healthy farmhouse breakfast, morning movement session with me, you get access to three different 60-minute spa treatments that you can choose from throughout the day, indoor pool and vitality suites, meditation, sound healing, an alchemy bar with kokodama and yogurts and pickles and sprouts workshops, retreat meals all made from locally sourced organic produce, Q&As and sing-along sessions with me. This is going to be an amazing, remarkable, once-in-a-lifetime experience. You get four nights full board accommodation in a deluxe room there at the facility and this thing, as you can imagine, is going to fill up fast. It's in Portugal at the Six Senses Retreat in Portugal. Again, all the details are at bengreenfieldlife.com slash six senses. And the dates are February 27th through March 3rd, 2023. February 27th through March 3rd, 2023. I hope to see you there. More than ever these days, people like you and me need a fresh, entertaining, well-informed, and often outside-the-box approach to discovering the health and happiness and hope that we all crave. So I hope I've been able to do that for you on this episode today. And if you liked it, or if you love what I'm up to, then please leave me a review on your preferred podcast listening channel, wherever that might be, and just find the Ben Greenfield Life episode. Say something nice. Thanks so much. It means a lot.